This episode of Sports in the Making is brought to you by Heirloom Travel and Adventure. Now is the time to start booking your vacation travel. Whether you want to experience the Alaskan wilderness, relax on pristine beaches, or explore historic European cities, Heirloom Travel and Adventure can help you find your perfect destination. Specializing in luxury, faith-based, and group travel, Heirloom Travel and Adventure is with you through all planning stages from start to finish to ensure your vacation is everything you envision. Visit heirloomtravelandadventure.com to begin your adventure today. Heirloom Travel and Adventure is a cruise planner's franchise, your land and cruise experts. Getting a job in sports television can be challenging. Having the right skills, making the right connections, and knowing where to start are just some of what's required to find that right position. My guest on this episode is helping people with sports broadcasting advice with valuable social media posts on LinkedIn and through his weekly newsletter, The Ministry of Broadcasting. Oscar Sanchez is Director of Broadcast Operations and Executive Producer and Media Distribution for CONCACAF, the Confederation of North, Central America, and Caribbean Association Football. He joins me to talk about his career, how he helps people find jobs in broadcasting, and more on Episode 39 of Sports in the Making. This episode has visuals, so if you're listening, be sure to subscribe to the Sports in the Making YouTube channel at Sports Making to see some of what we discuss. With me now is Oscar Sanchez, uh, who is very big into broadcast and inf giving information to people on LinkedIn. Uh, I was notified about him from a friend of mine who really enjoyed his content that he was posting. And, and once I, I, I started seeing that content, I did enjoy it myself, especially someone who's been almost 30 years in the broadcast sports industry. He's really sharing his information to help people who are young in the business grow into it and also just give general advice to people. So Oscar, thank you for joining me. Don, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure, it's, it's great. And I'm excited to be here uh, with you to talk about what we love, to talk about what many in, in our industry are doing and wanting to do also to join us. So I cannot be more excited to be here with you. Well, yeah, and, and the one thing that I do tell people all the time is this is a very glamorous industry. Yeah. But it's a lot of hotels, airports, and uh, events, and then you're gone to the next. So how would you describe this industry from your perspective? So, I would say it's a beautiful industry, and the most beautiful part of it, I would divide it into three. Number one, it's the people. Uh, I have met so many amazing people around the world. Uh, during my 25 years, it's great to see that you have friends, you make friends, and you make friends because you work together and you are uh, hustling and trying to make things happen and trying to overcome issues that come last minute. So that's number one. Number two is the opportunity to know great places, places that are fantastic, places that are going to be in your heart for the rest of your life. I mean, amazing, uh, you, you were telling me that you're in Denver. Denver is one of my favorite cities in the world. I am from a small town in Costa Rica originally. So when I was growing up, I never dreamed about going to a place like Denver. So I have been to Denver many times. I enjoy the weather, enjoy the people. So, and that happens with uh, cities around five continents. So that's those two are the most important things that I used to describe our our industry. Obviously, it's challenging. Obviously, it has a lot of uh, nice but also complicated moments throughout uh, throughout the day. Long days, airports, time away from our family, but it comes with the territory. Right. Okay. So, so talking about Costa Rica, small town, I am from a small town in Western Colorado. I, I, much like you, I'd never thought I'd be working in sports broadcast television. So how did you uh, decide that this was an industry that you wanted to work in? So I, I, I was in high school and I was doing the uh, newspaper of my high school. So I started like enjoying writing and doing all the all what you used to do because it was a different uh, setup 30 years ago. Remember, uh, we dreamed about being published in a physical newspaper and which is something that the kids probably are not dreaming right now. Uh, 
so I, I joined communications because I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to write in a newspaper, but life has many turns. Um, I saw an ad in the, my college uh, saying that they were looking for talent to be on camera in a music, uh, uh, in a show dedicated to entertainment. So I applied, I said like, why not? So I went, I got in, I started working and after a year, I was leaving the office and I always tell the story and I'll try to tell it quickly. And there was a, a phone ringing and, the, and I was like, no, nah, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm not, I'm not taking that call. I need to leave. My friends were waiting for me with a beer and, uh, and pizza. I went back, answered the call and it was a, a famous journalist in my country at that time that I was looking for somebody to be her assistant producer. I got the call, she, we talked. She said like, can you come? So I went. Long story short, 25 years afterwards, after that, I'm here. I started as an assistant producer, then I became a full-time reporter, then I became an anchor. Uh, after I did uh, sports, politics, entertainment, which was my, my first passion, uh, interviewing people around the world, everybody from Sylvester Stallone to Bon Jovi to, I mean, you pick your, pick, Pick their artists and me, most of them I, I was lucky to see. And then I, the natural evolution was going into production. And then I got into production and I, in the beginning, when you are in uh, talent on camera, you say, oh, but a producer is not as fancy. But then I realized that the ideas that you have here, it are easy to put them on screen if you are the producer or if you are behind the camera. So that's my story. It has been a, a nice ride. And it had taken me from Costa Rica to the United States and around the world. It's interesting when you say that about an, uh, talent and announcers and being on camera and then the production side of it, because that's what I found. My first career job out of college was as a sports reporter anchor. I was on air. I was doing everything, but I realized I didn't have any control. Yeah. And when you're on the production side, you have a little more control, a little more creativity when you started doing production side, what were the kinds of things that you felt like you had control over? I think it was the opportunity to develop more than just a piece. Because when you are a reporter, and even though in the, it depends on the country or in the area that you work, you have a little bit more control than in others, you had... I had control to a piece that I was producing, but uh, but when you are a producer, you have the chance to to not only see a section of your show, you can imagine the whole show. So we started creating, we started taking control or imagine how things could turn into longer interviews. How can we innovate into making a show more entertaining? How can we have control of those things that really were picking with the audience. So my first job as a producer, I, a full-time producer, was uh, in, a, in a morning show, kind of a, a US, uh, I mean, Good Morning America or something like that. And it was crazy because it was, I was producing content for, for, for women between 20 and 39 years old or 20 and 49 and I was 27 years old so it was like change your mindset but it's all it was also the opportunity to see how you can develop those specific pieces that were important to them and create the flow of a whole a whole show which is different when you are just reporting or being a talent on camera mm -hmm. when you made the jump to sports how did that happen and and where did it go in the first couple of years so sports have been always part of my life i played soccer until i was 20 years old i was a goalkeeper i was i i, I could say i was good enough i made it to second division in my country but at some moment it was like well are you playing or are you taking uh, continue your career so just like 99 percent of the people that get into sports only one percent become pro I'm part of the 99%. So when the opportunity arised, my first opportunity in sports was when I was in, I was an entertainment uh, talent on camera in the, one of the top news shows in Costa Rica. And Costa Rica qualified to the Soccer World Cup in, uh, that was Germany in 2000, no, that was Korea and Japan in 2002. 
So my boss told me, no, you can go on vacations because for the next month, we're not doing any entertainment. Everything is about soccer and uh, the country is gonna go around that. So I took my month off. After my second day, I got a call and uh, I was at the movies watching a uh, Star Wars movie. And it was uh, my boss and said like, hey, what are you doing? I was like, I'm, at the, I'm on vacations. Uh, what do you need anything? I said like, do you wanna go to Korea? And I was like, are you serious? And uh, she was like, yeah, we need a reporter and I think we, you're good. So I went to Korea and Japan and covered the World Cup. That was one of the best experiences that I, I have had had at that time. Then came back, do, did sports for my, and sports in Costa Rica sports is more like do soccer, you cover soccer. And so that was boring for me because it was the same very, so I went back to entertainment. And then when I became a producer, I saw that all the background that I had in sports, because I played soccer, I played basketball, I played handball, I played chess, and the entertainment side plus all the experience as a reporter and the small experience that I had as a producer was an, all that mix was a competitive advantage to me. So it was a natural evolution. And then I started producing uh, more soccer, not only in Costa Rica, but also in Central America. So I started, uh, being tasked to um, lead coverages uh, for uh, Olympic Games, for U UFI events in Europe. So that's how I evolved and that's how I, uh, I came to the place that I am right now. And now, right now, you're working with CONCACAF, if I'm not mistaken, as Director of Broadcast yes. Operations, Executive Producer and Media Distribution. Yeah. What does that mean? Because <laughs> there's a lot in there. There is a lot in there, but that it's uh, CONCACAF is the, the governing, governing body of uh, soccer in North America, Central America, and the Caribbean. It's 41 member associations, beautiful places from Canada to uh, Suriname or French Guyana, from Martinique to Costa Rica or Belize, uh, from USA or Mexico to Bermuda. Uh, we produce football games, football soccer games, over 400, almost 500 a year. Those are the games that are delivered to Fox, to ESPN, to uh, CBS, to uh, Univision, to Televisa, and to many partners around the world. So I work with a team that is responsible to produce those games. Everything from setting the standards that we're going to do for uh, use for production, uh, to execute the production, hiring the vendors, determine the uh, camera positions, evaluating the venues, uh, picking what for what platforms are we going to use in terms of transmission. So I've been lucky enough to learn a little bit of everything in our industry from uh, production, from uh, editorial side. The technical side has been a big blessing for me because I'm not a I'm not an engineer, but I have a I mean a dangerous enough knowledge of the engineering side to be able to work and to make myself under, understood by the technical uh, people, by our colleagues on the technical side. So that's pretty much what I do on, on my day to day. And, and what you just said about understanding a little bit about everything, I think is really important, not just for uh, a technician, say a camera operator, audio person, if they understand the whole picture it really makes the broadcast more more effective. Um, and, and the audience will never see it consciously. But I do know when I was a director, having been a, a camera operator, I knew exactly the different angles that I wanted and I knew what they were capable of getting. You know, audio the same way. You can boost the, the, the gnats a little bit more to get the effects a little bit better or bring them down a little bit. Um, explain to me how important that is for, for especially someone who's younger in the business to, to try and understand every part of the industry. So to me, that's crucial, Don, because we have to, you just gave an example with audio. When you are a producer and you only focus, oh, I need to be a producer and create this amazing script that the talent is going to be able to read on camera, but I want some music. So if I don't understand what's in the back end, I might not understand that audio, you can play with 16 channels of audio. So you can not only add music, you can add not sound and you can add sound effects and you can play with all that. 
So the best way for a producer or for somebody that is starting in the industry is to understand the language that our colleagues speak. So if you are in a production truck and there's an emergency and I go back to the EIC and I say, hey, can you help that problem that I'm seeing on screen? It's different than go to the EIC or to the uh, video operator and say, hey, the camera doesn't look good. I think the balance is not good or the pedestal is not correct. Can you work on it? And they might tell, at least we speak the same language. In we are communicators, no matter what role you do, if you're a camera operator, if you are in audio, or if you're a talent, you are. What we do is communication. And if we as a team, we cannot communicate each other and try to speak as much as possible the same language, is going to make it more complicated. So the guys, even the, the best talent that I know on camera that understand how an ENG setup works, those are the guys that I want to work with and that everybody wants to work with. with. So I, I cannot stress enough how important it is to have at least an, a one inch depth of technical uh, knowledge because it's going to help you go on a, a long, long way. Right. And talking about the helping aspect uh, of what you've what I've noticed on LinkedIn, um, you seem to be making connections with a lot of younger people. I do read a lot of the comments that you have. There, a lot of them are, 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 a lot of what you give is advice on like seven steps here, or there, or whatever on, on certain aspects of the industry. Those are things that I know I've thought about, but never really thought to share unless it comes up in a conversation. Where did the idea for you come from for you to share that information? I think I, going back to my story, Don, of I wanted to be a writer and I wanted to have my 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 pieces published. I I mean I still dream about publishing a book. So, but uh, at some moment I said like, what can I do to make my career more fulfilling? And you start thinking, oh, I can go and try to work in a Super Bowl, or I can try to work one more Olympic uh, Olympic Games. But then I realized maybe I can help somebody. Maybe I can help people just like others help me. And nowadays we have the advantage that uh, we have a global audience through social media, through, through all the platforms that are out there. So I decided to start uh, uh, writing on LinkedIn and share what, what we as part of the industry have been living in the last, in your case, 30 years, in my case, 20 something, and the others two or three years, because I find that we as an industry, we are not as, a, as we don't work together as other industries work. So we are, okay, the producers, oh, some are here, some are there, or you're in a guild, yeah, okay. But we as an industry, we need to find ways to help each other. And I think, I, and I was in LinkedIn and I said like, oh, there's my, where's my people? I don't see, I see lawyers and I see entrepreneurs and I see our human resources a lot, but where's my people? So I decided to start like sharing information, sharing um, advice, if you wanna, if we wanna call it that way, that I have gotten or have worked with me or based on mistakes that I have made. And that's how it all started. Do you think it's resonating with people? I know, I know I mentioned that I read some of the comments, but what kinds of things are you hearing about what you're doing? I think that the comments that I'm reading more than I'm reading or that I'm getting when I talk to people are related to first, we feel identified with what you are talking about. Oh, that happened to me. Oh, I never heard uh, somebody talking about this issue that happened to me two or three days ago. Oh yes, for sure, we all have been through them. Uh, it's one minute to air and things are not working and in 10 seconds before things fixed because everybody worked towards that or the, the famous uh, phrase, there's always something because there's always something in what we do or uh, it's just TV. So things that are common for us in the industry where people were not hearing about them. And now at least they are telling, 
thank you for helping me feeling identified, feeling seen for, I mean, for parts of my experience of my life that nobody had been talking about. It. Then the other part is like, we, I hear a lot of people saying, hey, you are not talking about technical side too much, but you talk about soft skills, what people call soft skills nowadays. And I was like, yes, I think because soft skills are what make a difference right now in, because we all have access to technology. It's not like in 30 years ago when you started, when I, I started, like you needed to be a millionaire to be able to have, uh, to create content or to share your message. Look, I'm not saying it's cheap. I'm not saying it's, but you have right now what 30 years ago would have been a dream only for those guys that had millions to put together. And you have, a, I mean, a wonderful channel and, and a podcast and everything. So, and you are reaching to audiences worldwide. So I'm telling the people, it's like, you have all these opportunities. Just remember three or four values that are so important. Being kind, it's number one. Help others along their journey. Number three, make sure that you are sharing what you know. And number four, just show up every day. If you show up in what you need to do, things are gonna go well because you have all the rest of the tools. So messages like that keep me going because it's, sometimes it's not easy. I have a job that is not even a nine to five. You know it, Don, we, we don't work nine to five. We work right. more than that. So I receive a lot of good feedback. It's, is it perfect what I do? Not. I mean, I, there's a lot of room for improvement. There's a lot more that I need to talk about or to put the finger where it, it hurts. Like, I think we have topics like uh, inclusion, like diversity that are still, I mean, still have a long way to go. But I, I think it's, it's good where we are and I think I can keep doing it for a while at least. Well, and to your point, uh, you know, the cost has come down drastically for people who want to get into it. I mean, this podcast alone, just for people who might be interested, cost me maybe a couple hundred dollars for the microphone, the interface. Um, the software is something that I paid for to record this. But then it just takes time to put it on a, on an audio podcast and then the video on YouTube. So it's not a, a lo it's not a huge investment other than your effort and time, but you have to take the initiative. And I think that's what I'm hearing you say a lot to uh, the people who are are viewing your comments is that a lot of this is just you can do it, just do it. Yeah, it's just a, it's just a matter to. We all have the the that voice inside our minds that say like, oh, it's maybe people don't won't care about it. Maybe people won't uh, be interested about it. Oh, why would I do this if I am not, I didn't make it to a network or I didn't make it to a streaming company. Why would I be doing this on, by myself? It's simple. Why not? It's like, why not? I think more and more initiatives like this and projects as beautiful as the one that you are doing are the bread and butter of our industry and are the future are the present already but will be the future because the beauty in next in next five ten years is that we will need to be working for a c or b is like we could be creating our own content and selling that whether to a b and c or to through our own platforms and i think we i'm always careful because there's a there are a lot of messages out there saying now like, leave your nine to five and go to leave leave the leave abc or leave cbs and go all in with your podcast and be, look at the others you need to take into account that there are outliers and the outliers are the guys that are like wow they make millions with their podcast and everything most of us might not make it most of us could make a good income on that but if you have the passion to do it and if you have the means and you can try to invest a little bit on that the result could be really great it could be a great um page for your portfolio because don if i have to hire you i would go and say oh look it's i'm not looking at a paper that says oh this is what it, this uh, gentleman has been doing I can look at your uh, at your projects and I can see, oh, 
he has an understanding of what producing a show is. Look at his editorial skills. He even managed by himself all the tech side. So it's in the worst case scenario, it's a great uh, business card for anybody. And I think the, uh, the, the key word you said there was passion. It has to be a passion project. I didn't start this with any grand illusions of grandeur of making tons of money off of it. If it happens, great. But it's more about sharing the people that I've worked with, their stories and all the cool things they've worked on. Because, uh, you know, I've, I've been at restaurants after a show and talking to a director or a producer or a camera guy even. And they'll tell me that they worked on this really interesting event. And it's like, oh, you worked on that? I didn't, I didn't have any idea. And they tell me these great stories. Now, trying to collect all those is kind of the challenge because yeah. of time and, and their schedules and everything. You mentioned some of the ideas that you're talking about and how you get them. I just want to read a list from the, some of your last LinkedIn posts, just the titles of them. Yeah. Here is my list of the most popular camera assignments right now. That's one. Top four traits I consider essential in sports replay operators. Seven practical ideas to screw your possibilities of growing at work. Seven unsexy tasks in broadcasting that will help you kickstart your career. I mean, they seem very basic on the, on the surface of it, but when you give those points, it makes a lot of sense. So I'm sure you have, you have a ton of ideas, but where do you see the most value for your audience uh, in those posts? I think it's more awareness than anything. It's more making them realize that what they are doing is valuable. So the post, for instance, about the camera, the camera operate, the camera positions, it's something, it's, uh, it's about a, a battle that all generations always have because usually the, if you have the analog editors and the digital editors, they're going to say, oh no, the digital editors are, go are not, they have everything easy because we, when we were editing in analog, everything was more complicated and we have to synchronize everything and fight with the tapes. But there's, there's a battle like in every, everything in life, uh, in, and when you, when you talk to camera operators, many of the guys that have been here for many years, they're like, no, I would never do a PTZ or a, oh, a drone is not something, that, that's not being a camera operator. But when you see how many of the kids, if you want to call it, because there are not only kids doing PTZ or you or doing a work with a, uh, with a GoPro, when you see the work that they can do is either at the same level of somebody operating a, a, a camera with a long lens or a handheld, and that's valuable and that's part of our industry. So we need to accept and we need to understand that broadcasting industry or the production industry is not only what we see at an NFL stadium or a soccer stadium or at the NBA venue, now it is more broader. And we have to be more inclusive. So my goal is to tell the kid that it's out there with his GoPro or her GoPro, hey, you are part of our industry. Feel proud. And to tell the other guys that are, have been here for a while that these, these kids are part of our industry and they deserve all the credit and we have to be one and work together and, and, and try to learn from one from each other. You've also posted a little bit about AI recently. Yeah. Uh, from an operations perspective, where do you see AI factoring into sports broadcasts in the near future? Wow, that's if you <laughs> done. If you ask me, I don't know where where we are gonna end up with, but that's my yeah. obsession right now. It's absolutely my obsession because I think there, even now, there are so many possibilities to. Uh, use AI in what we do. It is challenging because you start seeing, for instance, I, I was seeing a post this morning from uh, from Ruben uh, Hasid, a guy that it's all in, in in AI, and his bottom line was like, editors, get into the AI, if not, AI is going to get you. And editing is one of the areas where AI is uh, penetrating or affecting the most 
And we need to find ways. If I would be an editor, I'm, I'm a really bad editor probably, but if I would be a professional editor, I will start to find how can the developments in AI help me stay current and develop a better workflow for me and my projects. I think it's it's unavoidable. We are going to be some some jobs are going to be lost in this process, but some others will open. And I think it's is if you are in in many in any area, but if you are in broadcasting right now, you need to start thinking how can AI help me and help my team and help my process instead of how I'm going to be affected and being scared and being I mean doubtful about it because it's here it's not going to go anywhere and it's going to affect it's affecting already what we do I mean if you are you put a video through AI you get a synopsis in five minutes less than that I mean a minute and that's a synopsis that in the past could have taken 30 minutes for somebody to write it well it's a very simplistic yet complicated yeah. subject so we'll probably have to share that if we visit again in your position through the years, you've had to work on a lot of different events. What are some of the marquee events that you've been a part of? So I've been lucky enough because life had opened doors for me, or I could say that I opened doors for me, myself in many cases, but many people have helped me. So if you are a soccer fan, I've been into five or six World Cups right now, up to now. And that is a, that is a one of the biggest events you can be in the world. If you are into soccer, I work in everywhere from uh, Korea, Japan, to Germany, to South Africa. I'm looking forward to, to what is happening here in the US, Canada, and Mexico in 2026. Then after many years of doing soccer, I got the chance to do Olympics. And then I realized, wow, this is big, larger than life. The Olympics are, I, I haven't seen anything that makes me feel professionally and personally as, as, as uh, working in the Olympics. It's, uh, it's beyond the sports, it's beyond what you can do as a professional, it's the feeling, the, it's a whole city transformed around the Olympic spirit and when you are at an IBC in, uh, in, in the Olympic Games you have the opportunity to work with people even from those countries that you, they tell you do not go there because we have political issues with them and everything but we all come together and work together, so that was great. I've been I've been lucky enough to do uh, other events uh, here in the United States, and I have to to don't I don't know if it happens to you, but it happens to me. There are many events that are not like marquee events, but they brought a lot of satisfaction to my to my soul and to my professional life too. So we produce a lot of games in the Caribbean right now and, and we are producing more and more in CONCACAF on the women's side because the women's football is growing a lot and being able to broadcast games from many uh, countries and for many teams that in the past were not able to have a screen for them, that gives me a lot, a lot of satisfaction. And sometimes those games are three cameras and are, the complicated part is more how do you get the internet for your live use and your uh, TV use or whatever you're using or how do you get the app link to where you are doing. It's more complicated that part than the editorial side or the coverage. But the fact that you are able to show the effort that these teams are doing and that these women are doing makes me really, really happy. Producing uh, an event internationally versus domestic. I want to ask you the difference there, but before I do, I did spend a lot of time in the Caribbean while I was at the SPN covering baseball. A lot of the crew there had all the technical expertise. They were great camera operators. They did everything well. But the philosophy here in the U.S. as far as producing is a little bit different, or at least it was when I was there. Um, and so there was a lot of the, the producer role was basically just executing sponsorship, making sure that all the sponsorship got in. And I had to work with that team for a couple of years to really help them to do to tell stories and to create that content within the show to make, um, you know, make it philosophically what ESPN was looking for. 
at first I thought it was going to be a huge task because of the difference in that philosophy. But within three or four games, my producer, Alfredo Martinez, just kind of, he grasped onto it and he did a really good job. And then the director kind of fell in and all the camera guys, they started pitching stories within that event or, or coverage. So back to the question, what do you see a difference between producing something domestically in the U.S. versus uh, outside the rest of the, well, in the rest of the world? Yeah, there's, there, there are different cultural differences. There are differences in terms of resources. I think that the main difference is resources. Depends on, the, obviously, if you go to Europe, the difference in terms of resources is not that bad. Uh, but depending on the areas that you go, you'll see just like you just described it, people have the technical knowledge, they have the understanding of, uh, of what we do as better as any professional in the United States, but they don't have the resources because there's not, uh, the cost of a long lens could be probably the cost of the whole truck that they are using or the whole truck or the editor doesn't have the software to go and follow everything that he needs to follow. He needs to go everything by paper or I, I don't know, there, that's, I think that is, that will be my first uh, difference. Then second, the other thing is, uh, I think when we are in a country with not much as much resources as the U.S. or Canada or or Europe in terms of uh, broadcasting or even the, the, some of the Asian countries, you need to be you learn to be scrappy and. People here in the United States, we are scrappy, we find solutions, but uh, Don, let's be honest, if we have a problem with, a, with an app linking, 99%, you just grab your phone, you call your vendor, and your vendor is gonna send one, if you're unlucky, within 24 hours to where you are. They, some in some other places, or when you are producing abroad, you have to be scrappy to find solutions and to have everything in place and with all the redundancy required, therefore, if something happens and your uplink is not working, you have other things already aligned. Therefore, if the plane is gonna take three days to bring your uplink, you can still do your games. Um, and then, but from there on, it's not that it's not that much. It's like I think we we already around around the world, not already since the beginning of of this industry. There's passion. People are passionate. People feel proud about being able to produce something not only for their hometown but for the whole country or for around the world and you saw it with baseball baseball is something that goes not only here in the united states it's a passion it's i mean you have you go to the netherlands you go to curacao you just saw the little league and you saw the in a world series uh, at espn and the curacao team was as good as any of the other teams in i think sports unite us and broadcasting also unite us. As director of broadcast operations, what do you feel is maybe the least recognized position in a sports broadcast um, as far as crew goes? I'm a huge advocate for the audio guys. I think the, the audio side of what we do doesn't get the recognition that they deserve. They, and I see it, I, I say it because I've been in many places around the world and in some places, yes, and some productions, yes, but I would say that in more, many of the productions that I have seen, audio is like, okay, if it doesn't, if it is not failing, it's okay. But audio is so crucial and I write, I try to write about audio at least once a week or once every two weeks because the A1, the A2s, the guys that are the, 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 I mean, designing the audio plan deserve to be on the table, deserve a position on the table, just like the um, director of the show to be able to say, okay, we're gonna tell, the, the narrative for this game is this one, and we're gonna tell it with amazing camera shots, but also with a great audio coverage. So I think it's, it's, that's one position that I think we should be doing more on recognizing them. And that's one position that talking with many good A1s that I had to, the chance to work with, I think kids are not getting into audio. 
I think kids are like, mm, this is too complex. This is not as sexy as being the director, or not as sexy as being the executive producer. But audio is it's cool. All, audio makes it happen. So I, I would recommend, and I every time that I have the chance to recommend to somebody that it's looking for a path into our industry, go into audio. It's technically really cool. You have a lot of developments happening, much more, much more are going to happen in the, in the years to come. And it's crucial for any production. I'm really glad you said audio because that is my weakness. It's, <laughs> it's the most challenging. I know what I want and I know what I, I, I want to hear from, from a producer director perspective, but getting there is, is it, I mean, it is a hard job too. It, and they, they are engineers. Like yeah. they are very, very brilliant people. And so I'm glad to hear you say that. Um, now that said, there's a lot of crew positions on a, on a production. Yeah. You're in a position to hire people. What are the characteristics that you look for when you're looking to hire people? Maybe who, who are new to the industry or even those that do have a little bit of experience. Who are you looking for? I think I like to work with people and that sounds cliche, cliche, but I, I think it's, let's bring team workers, hard workers. Let's bring people that are going to show up. I like to work with high talented people that are like regarded. Oh, this guy is the best camera operator or this girl is the best a one, but I don't want to, I don't want to work with the best if that best person is not a team player. We, we always try to look into that. We try to look for people that are committed beyond. We, when you work with freelancers and we don't, we don't, we go work with tons of freelancers. We don't have people on, on in-house on a permanent role for, for the crew. So you try to work with freelancers that are going to commit, that are going to read their papers before they get to the show. The freelancers that are going to be uh, prepared and learn about the next gig that they are going to jump into. Uh, people that are willing to go beyond what their, what their usual description of the job is. I love getting into the venues and work with locals that are uh, used to work in that stadium or in that arena and they know where the door for the IO panel is, and they know where the, you run the cables, and, and they are willing to help. Because you see that people, and many that's not a trait that you see when you are hiring them for the first time, but once you hire them and you work with them, those are the guys that you want to stick to. And everybody from a runner that I'm always also about the, I mean, a good runner makes a difference in a show. If you don't have a good runner, you're not going to only suffer because there's no good coffee. But a good runner is the person that connects the dots in many things and requirements for the crew. So even starting with the runner, you have to have people that are willing to go all in and to be team players. I was at a Air Force college football game a couple of weekends ago, and I was looking down at the camera guys and... Yeah and the utilities that were with the cable. And I know utilities are typically day hires, you know, don't have much experience or getting into it, but the value of just having a utility to make sure that that cable was, it doesn't get, doesn't trip people up or gets all, you know, messed up. Well, that's what I saw. And I felt really bad for everybody involved because the camera guy couldn't get to where he was trying to get to the um, the the first utility was trying to get that take you know cable unplugged or uh, untangled and then the first one who was feeding it was trying to like he he just you know he knew he got himself in a tangled mess and and it was just taking too long and i just felt i've been in that situation starting off in my career so so i understood it all of this talk about crew and everything, I want to talk about what your next endeavor is, and that is the Ministry of Broadcasting. Can you explain what that is and what you're trying to do with it? So I created, I mean, after being uh, writing on LinkedIn for a year, I said like, okay, I want to write something that it's broader, that ha I, it doesn't have the limitations that a platform because I mean Twitter has these limitations of characters and um, same with LinkedIn or so I decided okay let's try a newsletter 
to try to make community, to, to build the community, and that's what the Ministry of Broadcasting is. Uh, it's like a community right now, we're in over 2,500 people that receive the newsletter every Saturday. Uh, it's just another window for me to share with the audience what are my thoughts or what are not necessarily my thoughts but what are the important news opinions stories that could have an impact in their lives and could have an impact in their in their career so i have been written i think i'm on 35 i need to write 36 for saturday by, by at the time that we're recording so I've written from everything from AI to uh, being kind to uh, how can you, what can you do when you have been knocking on all your doors and you don't get a job in broadcasting? What are options do you have? Things like that. I think people have responded very well. It's, it's, uh, I feel so happy when I get an email from a person saying, hey, what you wrote today helped me a lot what you wrote today helped me going uh, and talking with uh, a guy in a crewing company that I had never talked to, but I decided to talk and I got a job and I got a position. Not that I can find jobs for people, but I, I think I can help and encourage them to find ways and to value what they know, value their skills and build a better, a better and bigger network and they can find whatever they need. So it's a, it's a, I like it. It's a nice experience. It's writing every week. It, it keeps me on my toes. And uh, it's, it, it's an opportunity for anybody that can uh, join us. It's free. Every Saturday, 6.55 Eastern. I don't wake up. I program it the day before. So <laughs> <laughs> You might uh, be on the road too, yeah. Yes. And, but you know what, Don, it's, it's curious because we are, we are weekend workers. We work on the weekends and I can tell that my people, my audience, all of us that are reading and listening to each other and everything, we work on the weekends because the consumption of content that I publish and the other friends that I have talking to, I have been talking to, goes down on Friday and Saturday, but because people at least here in the US, they are traveling to their uh, college football game or they are traveling to whatever, so they don't have the time. And it's, it's interesting to see how we, how, we, how we tackle that and how people read and consume content for, uh, in our industry. Well, you can find the Ministry of Broadcasting at oscarsanchez.us. Yes. So make sure you check it out. Thank you. Uh, a couple more questions for you here, Oscar. Um, what do you think the most memorable event you've worked on is? Oof, the most memorable event? I think it's London 2012, the Olympics. That was something out of, mm, out of this world. It was a great experience. Uh, something that completely changed my focus because when you are and that happens to us a lot when you have been working in sport in one sport you think that whatever happens in that environment it's the top of the world and then you realize that just like football in the US is so important cricket in India uh, or in the Caribbean or somewhere else is so important so Olympics helped me and put me in a humble position to realize okay I have done many things but this is a great moment to learn that there are other steps and other sports and other areas where I can keep growing. Okay, I, I wouldn't be um, a, a good interviewer if I didn't ask this question. Uh, what's the best advice you've ever been given in this industry? What's the best advice? Well, this is, to be honest, this is probably the first time that I got this question, even though, even though you get... <laughs> so I guess I'm doing my job right Yeah, you're doing, your, you're doing a very good job. Uh, Don, I think the best advice was from a, um, a former boss. He's a lawyer. He was not a, he was the president of the company. And he said, like, you can have all the skills in the world, but if you don't know how to adapt to the uh, curveballs that the, that the life and your job are gonna throw into you, it's everything that you know is useless. So you, if you know how to adapt, especially in an industry like ours that we plan for years to, de 
deliver something and the last minute things change, you are not going to be able to keep growing and to last long in this in this industry. Yeah, and I, I would say, you know, some of the things that I've been told, uh, it's some of that as well, but in this industry, it's about who you know and the networking. But that'll only take you so far because once you get in that position of, of having that responsibility, if you don't deliver, you may never get another call again. So you really have to take everything seriously. Yeah. Uh, how, how, have you ever come across people that, that are great networkers and then maybe their work isn't that great or they just don't know how to network, but they're really good at what they do? I think both, both extremes I can imagine myself. I'm uh, born in Costa Rica. I got here when I was 35 years old. Uh, got to an NFL stadium to work in a, a football game, uh, and then the camera operator that was seated in the in the position looked at me and said, "Like, oh, I barely understand your English, but uh, okay, I'm here with you." The guy was quiet, and I said, uh, "What is it with this guy? What's happening with this guy?" And then I realized that the guy was not good at networking. But then I got to meet him more tremendous tremendous camera operator but a nice person such a great person he was just introvert and he was just not into it i have found many uh, women in our industry that suffered the, the 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 challenge that this still in some places it is it's a white boys club and they sometimes stay quiet. I mean, talking about the women, they stay quiet because I say like, oh, I, I have my job, but I, 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 I'm not gonna raise my hand and give my opinion because these guys might not like it. So I think there are many people out there that they might not feel that they are good at networking, but they do a tremendous job. And if they would take courage from themselves, or from the people around them and we could recognize them and give them the opportunity to raise their hand and give their ideas, we will discover amazing people that could benefit our, our, our crews and our teams. It's an interesting perspective and, and I know I've felt it, but I've never had anyone express it as eloquently as you just did. So, um, okay, a couple more questions here. Um, what is your favorite sports movie? Oh. My favorite sports movie. I think I don't. Ha I have to be honest. Probably I don't have. I love the the football oriented movies. I think football, soccer, no football, football, football American football. American. Because I yeah. think Hollywood is really good at telling stories about our uh, about everything in the sport of football. And they are super, super inspiring. They are really good. And they discover stories that are just there. And then people don't realize that even their hero uh, have a background and have a, a great story. Uh, I love, love Coach Carter, that movie. I mean, that's, that's a, great, a great movie. So, but I think there are, there are others that are, that are out there, but in my case, I love the, the, the football, uh, a good football movie. It's something that I like to sit down and, and, and watch. Very good. And then finally, uh, before I let you go, what is your most cherished or memorable piece of memory that you have from a sporting event? Uh, credential, I see an Emmy behind you. Um, Anything like that, what is the most special for you? I haven't been a collector or somebody that uh, valued my those pieces of memory. I regret it because I started like saying like four or five years ago, oh, where are my credentials for from this and for that? I, I, I value a lot and probably if from a sports event, Probably it's the credential of the first World Cup that I attended. Obviously, the one of the Olympics that I mentioned it. Um, uh, the Emmy was for uh, Copa America Centenario tournament that we did in 2016. I think I value also with within this craziness of industry that we work. Uh, you want? I had to cover the all the 9/11 events. 
here in the United States because I happened to be in Los Angeles when uh, this tragedy happened back in 2001. And my boss told me, I don't care if you do entertainment and you are there for the Grammys, you need to go to New York. It was obviously terrifying, uh, deep experience in, for me as a professional, but also it was a big commitment. And that piece of paper that I have, that I, I, for those that went to Manhattan in those times, you had to go first to the New York Police Department in, in Lower Manhattan to get your credential. And that credential, every time that I see it, is like, it makes me think about what this country and what we went through it. It made me think about all this suffering that I saw. It made me think about how not only a city, but a country can come together to support each other. And it makes me never forget it. So to me, it's really, really, really important. And even though it is not sports, it's part of, we are, we're producers, we're reporters, we're whatever, but at some moment we are just com communicators. And if I have to do something like that, I had to do it and I, I, I tried to do it the best way possible and it left a very, very deep uh, memory in my heart and in my mind and, and in my professional life. At the end of the day, sports is fun, but real life takes priority. Yes. Uh, and uh, and it's uh, a, a, an interesting perspective that you have there. Um, you know, so so thank you for sharing that, Oscar. I appreciate your time with me today. I appreciate getting to know you. You are much more kind than I even imagined. Even though I knew that you know the pro the value you're providing on on what you're doing makes you a nice guy to begin with but it is such a such a pleasure visiting with you and and i hope that somewhere down the road we happen to work with each other because i'd love to meet you in person no i i love to meet you in person uh don i appreciate the, the invitation i appreciate the opportunity to be able to share with your audience what what i'm doing but more important i appreciate the opportunity to start our relationship with you and hopefully to stay in touch uh, helping each other and sharing uh, because you're talking a lot about what I'm doing but I think what you're doing is tremendous and it's helping many many people as well trying to determine what their paths are keeping in, in motiva motivated when they need to uh, go through tough moments so that in kudos to you and thank you for having me oh, thank you very much and oscarsanchez.us so make sure you take a visit thank you for anyone looking to learn how to get into the sports broadcasting industry, be sure to subscribe to Oscar's The Ministry of Sports Broadcasting newsletter. He's got a ton of valuable information. In fact, his latest LinkedIn post as of this episode, five real life situations in broadcasting that can destroy your mental health. And he gives a short list for people to think about. A special thank you to Heirloom Travel and Adventure, a cruise planner franchise, for sponsoring this episode. Visit heirloomtravelandadventure.com and start your travel planning today. Again, if you're listening, you can check out some of the visuals on YouTube at Sportsmaking. And if you like this episode, be sure to subscribe on your preferred podcast listening platform. If there's someone who works in the sports industry that you'd like to hear from, drop a comment on YouTube or the Facebook page. Also, like, share, and review. Thank you for spending time with me on Sports in the Making. I'm your host, Don Cardona. Don Cardona.